of the things I think you find in romance novels, especially as they've changed in the, from when I started writing in the 1980s, well, there was the pulp novels where um, the two women met. It wasn't even necessarily two women, but there was a lot of angst. And ending up happily was just not the way it was supposed to be. You ended up sad. You ended up... The, the, there was always the, not a lesbian, but in love. She went back to her husband. And then there was the lesbian who <sighs> went away. Or killed herself. One or the other. And, and it was Ann Bannon was the one who changed that, who had the women stay together. And that was a complete miraculous change in the literature and it changed everything for everybody and um, I read my first Bebo Brinker standing up at the Cal State Library because I couldn't check it out because I wasn't a university student yet so I, I read most of it just standing there couldn't put it down um, and so libraries are beautiful things um, and after that for me the big novel was Curious Wine and yeah. you're all going yeah, yeah. Oh, Curious Wine and what was it about Curious Wine that was so different and I Catherine Force is the one who put it in words, because she says it so succinctly. You have two women who are presented as having every other choice in the world, and they choose each other. So she deliberately made them beautiful and successful, attractive to men. They had the choices of life with men, they, and yet they fall in love and they choose each other. And that's just that story just keeps, that never gets old. It's just perpetually wonderful. And from that, I think we all the generations of writers that come from Catherine, which writer generations are like they're two years, three years, five years or so, and you go from Catherine to everybody she touched at Night Press, and then everybody who read everybody at Night Press who now writes themselves, and it's just this incredible, she was a little tiny pebble, and it's just spread forever. Um, and so now in romance novels, what you find a lot, a central story arc is not necessary, not just that the two women find each other, that in the process of that, they find who they are, and they come into who they are, and their own personal strength and what they want from life. And they resolve that before they connect as, as a couple, or their connecting as a couple helps them resolve their own inner issues. Um, and that rarely is love can seen as a solution. It's seen as a natural outgrowth of having finally gotten my act together or having solved this res resolution. As with the, the snippet I read with Marissa and her mother, she finally comes to peace with, in terms with her mother and deals with her in a way she can handle. And that helps her when the love of her life comes into her life and they've already, they've already missed their chance once and this is the second chance and it gives her a very different approach because she's learned you can talk about things that are painful and you can deal with it. Um, so this is from a book that's not out yet but it will be out in June. It's called The Kiss That Counted. So I'm reading a little snippet ahead. And um, this is a dramatic scene hopefully you will all forget when you read the book. And it won't, it won't, um, you'll, you'll remember, you'll be going, wait a minute, what happened in that scene? And it'll, if you remember, it'll spoil it, so forget. <laughs> you have until June, hopefully like, watch a lot of L Word, it'll all go out of your head. <laughs> so this is a, a, a short little bit, but it's a, the dramatic moment. I've got um, two characters, it's set in Denver. Um, one character grew up in a very, bad family situation, which will become clear when you read the novel, and, and her family has found her, and she has to confront them. And, um, and so she, some of this is going to be a little confusing, but you, you'll get the gist of it. And so she, her family has found her, she has, is in her apartment, she's with the woman she's fallen in love with, and two friends, and, and so the scene unfolds with those players in the room. Your family has been waiting a long time to settle with you, Cassie June. Aunt Biddy leaned on her cane with menace. Your father is still sitting in Big Sandy waiting for you. You saved your own skin when you said it was him that pulled the trigger. You owe us. You're one of us. CJ's voice was shaking, but there was nothing she could do about it. You listen to me, old woman. I've got, I got no deal for saying he did it. There was no plea bargain. His hand was on the gun, too, and he deserves to rot in prison. All you had to say was that he never touched it. You were a minor. Instead of 25 to life, he'd be out by now. You wouldn't have done more than five. You turned on him. He turned on me by telling me to lie to save his skin. A lighter sentence for him and a longer one for me. That was his proposal. No matter how much I said, no matter how much I did what he said, I was still disposable to him. CJ pulled herself up short. There was no point in arguing with Aunt Biddy. So I lied, just a little. Don't it make you proud? <laughs> Burnett from behind her said quietly, you can't have regrets if you're dead, CJ, remember? Well, out of the mouths of babes, CJ wanted to say, but she heard the siren at the same time Aunt Biddy and Daria did. The three of them cocked their heads, evaluating if it was coming closer. The shared blood, the long history must be plain to everyone else now. Lucy brought her cell phone out from behind her back. 
Yes, they're coming here. You've got to love text messaging. CJ didn't know if it was a bluff, but the siren was definitely getting louder. Aunt Biddy and Daria had to be thinking about the code of the gathering. When the cops were on the way, all fights stopped. They resume again when the cops left. In front of cops, social workers, any outsider, they were one big happy family. CJ knew if she played by those rules, she was back dancing to Aunt Biddy's tune. And never again, she swore that her second night in Fayette. Never again. But what had changed, and how could she fight them? What did she have now that she hadn't had then? Time's running out. Carita was as calm as she had been last night, facing the idiot with the baseball bat. But she'd learned that people like that really would hurt her if they could. Yet she stood her ground just the same. You run along now. Shoot. Lucy and Burnett, they hardly knew her, yet they were defending her. CJ heard the echoes of the kind things that her co-workers had said, the offers of friendship and introductions to nice women from her friends. Maybe they saw someone she didn't, but she had her whole life to learn to see herself the way they did. Lord knows she ached to be who they thought she was. She wanted to be the woman that Carita loved. So forget that scene. Things happen, but, um, and CJ is an unusual character. She has a very kind of dark past that she's trying to escape. And on the other hand, Carita... Um, is is a vi she's just as light as a feather as a person. She, everything she touches, she en enhances. She's sweet. She's lively. Everybody loves her. She's never had a negative thing happen to her except for one heartbreak. And and so you get this dark force and this light force, and they they kind of collide. And CJ doesn't want to believe that someone like Karita can exist, and Karita doesn't want to accept that CJ could be as dark as she seems to be. So they. I really wasn't doing the Zena and Gabrielle thing. I really, really wasn't. <laughs> Just kidding. But I, I, I'm more of a, like, what would happen if a thief and an elf met? And how would they reconcile their differences? So that was that story. So that kind of wraps up my comments and everything. And I was going to take questions and see what anybody wanted to ask about or talk about.